with that, I'm going to check the questions and answers again. What is the cause of subdural effusion and hypotension? Um, that's a good question. So presumably there's actually negative pressure in the subarachnoid space so that it's actually exerting sort of like a vacuum on the pachymeninges to the point where it's actually pulling basically the dura and causing the subdural effusions to occur. So that's, that's what we believe is happening basically. And that's what we believe is causing the enhancement as well. It's causing inflammation. Do you stent vocal venous sinus stenosis the patient only have tinnitus? Oh, that's a really good one. So um, I will often do their full workup. I'll do their LP, see what their pressure is. And if their pressure is very high to the point where I'm worried about them, um, then I will often offer them the, the um, venous sinus pressure measurements. And I do all this awake. So I'll, I'll basically do an LP. I'll tell them, hey, your pressure is 30. You just, you're lucky that you don't have papilledema. Um, let's go ahead and do venous sinus pressure measurements if you're okay with it. And I'll just flip them over and do the venous access and just quickly, you know, I, I use a very small microcatheter, so I don't even give them that much heparin. So it's safe to do on the same day. I give them like 1500 heparin and I just throw in like a five French, um, diagnostic catheter, like usually a Berenstein or Vert or something. And then I'll throw like a Prowler Select Plus through, and then I'll just, I'll measure the pressures all the way across. I mean, it takes like 10 minutes of added time. And then in, in most cases, like if the pressure gradient is there, I'll just tell them it's there. And then we'll have a big conversation in clinic. But I can tell you, I've never personally stented anyone who just had tinnitus. I've stented someone who had tinnitus and bad headaches, but never just tinnitus. Okay, next question. What is, this, what is the specific sign of imaging studies for NPH and not any kind of hydrocephalus? Ooh, um, I don't think there really is a specific sign for NPH and imaging. Um, that colossal angle um, that we were that we were talking about um, really just predicts, you know, atrophy versus hydro. I don't think there is an imaging specific finding. It's just a general gestalt that there is um, enlargement of the ventricles. It's out of proportion to the degree of overall volume loss, and that colossal angle is narrow to the point where we suspect hydrocephalus. It really is a clinical diagnosis, and that's what I fall back on anytime someone tries to push me on uh, on NPH. That's generally um, what I do. So someone's asking what the stroke volume cutoff is. There any role? Uh, oh, sorry, this thing's man. I'm getting a lot of questions real quick. <laughs> so the cutoff that I use is 100 because we have G machines. And then um, in which side or CSF venous fissure is more frequently, and in what level? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I find them to be more common actually on the uh, right side of the patient and more common at the thoracolumbar junction. And I think the reason that that happens is because the pressure actually, yeah, it, it, I think it's just because the pressure is a little bit lower, meaning there's less interference with the fistula forming because you're closer to the IVC, closer to the, uh, uh, also closer to the uh, azagous, hemiazagous system, et cetera. Um, Let's see, what about agenesis of the transverse sinus? Oh, that's a good question. So um, agenesis of the transverse sinus, I've never seen bilateral. I've seen it unilateral in the setting of a, a, a contralateral stenosis. And in those cases, those, a lot of those patients do end up benefiting from a stent. Um, but yeah, agenesis is a good thing to think about when you're, when you're talking about stenosis. So that's where the gradients come in when you're actually measuring the pressure gradients. You, you need to make sure it's significant. Let's see here. Um, regarding follow-up hydrocephalus, is there any objective score that can be used? I assume they mean for NPH. Um, no, there's not really an objective score that that I've used. Um, I'm not aware of one. Um, that being said, um, somebody's saying Crocrum KRAD scale. I've not used that. I just I look at the colossal angle and it. Oh, Chiari 1.5. Yes. Um, how can we determine normal pressure hydrocephalus in a background of generalized atrophy? Oh, that that that's actually gets back to the closal angle. So that that's a good question too. I mean, that closal angle tells us basically that it's probably more likely hydro and not just generalized atrophy because the normal closal angle is actually usually greater than 100. If it's less than 80, it's more likely to be um, NPH. But I don't use any other scoring system because I don't think anything's reliable. I, I just, as a gestalt, I look at it if the ventricles are bigger than I would expect for the degree of volume loss, then I just measure the closal angle. If it's positive, then I just say, this is suggestive of NPH in the appropriate clinical setting. And then the, the neurologist evaluates the patient. They say, yeah, if it looks like NPH, 
then they send them back to me. And then I end up doing the LP or a three day float of, of a three day uh, uh, lumbar drain trial. And if it's positive, then they go to shunt. Occasionally, like I said, I'll use uh, I'll do a flow study and, and just see if um, if if it jives with my um, with my flow diversion uh, or sorry my temporary flow diversion, particularly if they're immobilized and they they can't walk. Um, let's see. Do you use CT and MR Milo in the same setting? How much MR max contrast can be used? Okay, so I personally never use more than 0.5 intrathecal gadolinium. I usually stick to 0.3. As far as I'm aware, there's no FDA approval for that. I normally just uh, tell them it's off label and actually put it in the consent that this is off label. Um, and that's that's usually what I will do. Um, do you use the NPH scale from Scandinavia? No, I don't use that NPH scale. Um, let's see. About intracranial hypertension, what do you think is the most reliable MRI finding? Oh, um, Honestly, optic disc cupping and, and optic nerve sheath um, dilation, I think is probably most reliable in intracranial hypertension. I see empty cellas all the time and it means nothing. Um, the other thing that's pretty reliable is diffuse sinus narrowing in the appropriate clinical setting along with those, um, with those findings within the optic nerve sheath. So if you have diffuse sinus narrowing, um, particularly um, along the superior sagittal sinus as it transitions into the transverse sinuses, if you have narrowing right there, a lot of those patients have, have NPH. Uh, patient 50 female, CSF leak, history of direct head trauma, last 20 years, what suitable imaging needed? So from nose, oh, okay. Um, so I normally do a super thin section max face to see if I can see a dehiscence. And then I actually go to nuclear medicine pretty quickly. And when I do the nuclear medicine scan for those patients that I'm looking for uh, CSF rhinorrhea, I actually raise their pressure substantially. I take them to 35 centimeters of water with Elliott B solution um, right before, or sorry, right after I inject the nuclear medicine tracer. So first thing I do is I do my LP. I confirm I'm intra intrathecal with a little bit of um, uh, iodinated contrast. Then I inject the radio tracer. Then I inject a lot of Elliott Bs, or you can inject saline and get them up to 35, just intermittently monitoring. Also, you, you kind of tolerate to their, you kind of titrate to their tolerance. Some people won't get to 35. Um, if you can get them to 30, even 25, that makes a difference. But if you leave them with a, a CSF hypotension uh, or, or even a normal pressure, you might not elicit the leak. So I, I typically try to get them around 30 if I can, um, even for that. And then, then I normally have my ENTs pack the nose with pledgets right before, and we actually count the pledgets. Um, you can also do thin section T2s through the anterior skull base and try and see if you can see the CSF leak. Um, there are some cases where you can see that hiss is a little bit better on thin section um, T2 cube or Fiesta imaging compared to just a, a plain um, maxillofacial CT. But that being said, seeing the dehiscence, you're relying upon seeing a tiny, usually a, sign, a tiny encephalocele, basically is what you're looking for. How to differentiate small perineural cysts from CSF leaks on plain scan. You can't. Um, it's impossible. If the patient doesn't have, um, if the patient has a prior MRI of the brain and they don't have a, um, they, they do not have a positive burn scale score and they don't have symptoms of CSF leak, then it, it clearly is just a normal perineural cyst. But if they have signs of CSF leak on MRI and or clinical, then you just have to report that there are perineural cysts in all these locations. Um, and in general, if you've already done um, that, you could you could ask your tech, you know, to go ahead and try and do a fat sat T2, but that's going to add a lot of time to your scan. The fat sat T2 is really useful. If you go back or if you remember back earlier when I was showing a fat sat T2 of that young uh, lady who'd had the lumbar puncture, you could see stranding in the epidural space. So basically on, on the fat sat T2 around a perineural cyst, you can see stranding in the epidural, uh, epidural fat when there's a positive CSF leak. And that, that can help you kind of focus on one perineural cyst. I, I think that probably is what you're asking, basically a fat sat T2. But on a standard scan, you can't tell if a perineural cyst is, is going to be a leak or not. You need the fat sat T2 at minimum to be able to tell if it's, if it's really suspicious. Threshold for stroke volume to be in CSF flow study. Again, I go back to the 100 microliters for G or 42 microliters for Siemens, um, but I still rely ultimately on on a um, on a temporary flow uh, temporary flow diversion, meaning like a, um, a a lumbar puncture or a uh, or a, um, a lumbar drain. Is there any significance using needle gauge size when doing CSF? Yes, there is significance. So um, when you're doing a high flow, when you're looking for a high flow leak, um, somebody asked a question about what size gauge needle to use. 
So if you're doing a high flow leak, you need to be able to inject the contrast really quickly if you're doing a DSM. So I use a 20 gauge needle to be able to inject it quickly. Um, that being said, if you're doing a high flow leak in CT, presumably you got the head up for a while and you're actually injecting slowly. The, the sort of the distinction is, is that in, uh, in a DSM, <clears throat> the patient can't be moved. So in a DSM, you already have the head down. So you have to inject quickly and wait for it to flow up. Whereas in CT, you can inject the entire volume and drop the head. You can't drop the head and do a DSM as easily. Um, you, it's, it's theoretically possible if your table moves really, really quickly for you to drop the head and quickly subtract and then before the contrast runs in. Um, but I tend to use the smallest gauge needle I can for the low flow leaks because I don't want my puncture to obscure the leak, basically. So I try to use the smallest thing I can. Um, the, the, the good compromise, though, is the Gertie set. So the, there's a Gertie set out there that I think it has a 20 gauge coaxial. It's about an inch and a half long and then a 22 gauge pin can that goes through it. Um, I've had a lot of luck with those. So um, for those sort of leaks where I'm not sure if it's high flow or not, if I think it may be a type two lateral leak and it may be kind of high flow, um, then I'll use that Gertie set. It's a good compromise. But when I think it's a low flow leak, I tend to use a 25 basically a discogram set more or less. What needle should we use for diagnostic LPs? Um, I, I tend, like I said, I tend to use that Gertie set for a diagnostic LP if I'm worried about CSF leaks. Um, if I'm not worried about CSF leaks, I'm trying to do a very, very quick um, assessment of whether or not someone has NPH, I tend to use a bigger needle because <laughs> uh, I don't want to sit there all day. So I, I tend to use a 20 gauge needle and I have this 33 inch one meter tubing that I hook to the 20 gauge needle and I actually raise the head of the bed up and I actually drop the tubing down lower. And um, generally I can finish a high volume LP in about 15 minutes. So our epidural CSF leak surgical emergencies like hemorrhages, they can be if they're really fast. So if an epidural leak is extremely fast um, to the point where the patient's comatose, it can be an emergency. Um, I've run into those situations where I don't even have time to localize them and I tell you exactly what I do. Usually the epidural space is so engorged because of the leak and it's so stoopy, for lack of a better way of saying it, that you can put almost anything into the epidural space. So I'll take a vascular forefront sheath and actually just use like a TUI needle uh, and get my TUI needle in the epidural space. I take a really steep angle into it. And then once I get in there, I'll put like either an 035 or a, a nitrex wire into the epidural space and I'll put either a four French radial or, or just a small four French um, vascular sheath into the epidural space. And then I'll put like a vert, a four French vert or a four French Berenstein catheter over an 035 wire. And I will run a catheter all the way up the dorsal epidural space to the cervical thoracic junction. And I will patch them with 100, 125 cc's of blood, generally injecting about two to four cc's per level, titrated to the patient's ability to tolerate it. Um, but that's how I deal with, with emergent leaks, like where I don't really have time to localize it. Like the patient's comatose, I, I need to do something fast. So I'll put in a catheter and just inject a lot of blood. Uh, what is the anticoagulation policy for venous stent and follow-up? So I normally will give them aspirin and Plavix for three months. I do check levels for those. Um, so I check PTY12 level and aspirin verify now, and I send out whole blood platelet aggregation for ADP and, um, and for the AA levels um, because they're more reliable, but they're a 24 hour send out lab for us. So if the PTY12 level is less than 194 and the aspirin is less than 550, I normally feel comfortable proceeding. Um, and then I'll wait for the, the final numbers. But generally, I like them to, to be below 50% um, when, I'm, when I'm putting in a venous stent on the ADP activation. Um, and then for AA, I like them to be about the same, below 50%. What is flow compensated fiesta for the spine? Essentially, we, we put on EKG leads and we're actually timing the patient's heart. And we're compensating for flow based on when their heart beats, because when their heart beats, they're brain pulsates, essentially. I mean, and we're, we're actually compensating for essentially when their heart beats and when the, when, the, when the CSF is moving. So it's almost like gating. I mean, and, and you can do it that way. Um, another way, there, there are a couple other ways to do it, but I'm not a physicist, full, full, um, full disclosure. There are other ways to do flow compensated fiesta, but you can gate based on the heartbeat. Um, and then there, there are a couple other ways to do it. But in general, um, flow compensated Fiesta is helpful because it removes a lot of different artifacts. Fiesta itself removes truncation, and then the flow compensation removes the flow artifacts so that you can see those epidural collections much more easily. But you can either, you can either uh, gate to the cardiac cycle, uh, or there's a couple other tricks. And again, I'm, I'm not a physicist, so I, I don't know all of the, the tricks to that. But I have a very good physicist here, and they, they do really nice flow compensated fiestas for us, and, uh, and that's, that's how I see a lot of my CSF leaks. Okay.
Looks like we have all of our questions and answers um, done. I really appreciate everyone sticking around to the very end. And I, I hope this was helpful. I know it's a lot of information to throw at you all at once. And it, it's, it's as comprehensive as I can get about the specific topics I'm talking about in this amount of time.